This episode, we're headed to the largest First Nations community in Canada, located along the banks of the Grand River outside Brantford, Ontario. Their histories with the settlers of Canada stretches way back to the American Revolution. And since then, the relationship hasn't been exactly smooth. Approximately 95% of the land that was negotiated to live on in 1784 has been lost, and they have been in litigation with Crowns Canada since 1995. We're gonna cover a lot. Cooking, eating, agriculture, history, and current issues. Talking to Tanya Brandt, chef owner of Yawego, and getting knowledge bombs from her mother, Terry Lynn Brandt, a sea keeper, both who are of Mohawk descent, and whose indomitable spirits to persevere in the face of erasure is inspiration. We're also going to visit a replica of the Haudenosaunee Longhouse, their traditional dwelling from centuries ago. I'm super curious. I live in North America, but I know very little of what the original inhabitants ate. To date, the food hasn't been marketed like that clown trying to sell happiness to children with little toys. What I love about Tanya is she doesn't give two shits about trying to placate tourists. She's concerned with feeding her community and undoing centuries of gastrointestinal obliteration at the hands of colonists. Six Nations is known for just like home-cooked food. Anywhere you go, they expect home-cooked like soups and meals, breads, things like that. And if you don't have that, you're not going to have very many customers. So we do make everything from scratch here. Our breads, even our salad dressings, juices, wow. like everything, right? Basically, I want to see the best for my community. I don't care about lining my pockets in the process, yeah. right? Because this community and our health and so many things that is being affected right now, like money is the least of our worries. It's no surprise that the brutal dispossession of indigenous peoples from their lands and destructions of their social systems are tied to health inequities. Indigenous peoples suffer lower life expectancy, higher infant mortality, and higher rates of disease than the general population. You gotta get a taste of home when and where you can, right? For me, that's the big thing and that's my interest is how are we inspiring people to indigenize our everyday foods. You have to develop that palate. They'll tell you you have to try something 100%. like eight times, right? Yes, how long does it take to decondition your mind out of 300 years of programming? I just want our people to be like inspired by our food and yeah. how do you work it into your diet today, right? Like what's everyday indigenous eating for us now? It doesn't look like, you know. Yeah, so this is a perfect example of that because it's perfectly relatable. It's mac and yeah. cheese, but you're replacing the pasta with hominy. Just the fact that I'm using hominy because in this community we only use white corn, but it's so expensive. You know, I know that I'm lucky that way. Yeah. that I do have access, but that access is because we grow it. For the Haudenosaunee, corn breeds like Tuscarora are treated with the utmost reverence for their life-giving properties. I knew corn was important, but Tanya helps me comprehend why there is a sanctity-like reverence bestowed upon corn. Besides its versatility for dishes like corn soup, corn bread, and corn mush, it's also used for ceremony. Yo, its nutritional values, or at least the traditional non franken corn versions, are off the charts. So you can imagine how the displacement of this life-giving wonder food has left an irreplaceable void. I don't yeah. care about Hoi Toy is having my food. I want to see little kids eating corn soup. That's what I want to see. I just want our communities to have wholesome foods. I don't care about impressing other people. You guys can't smell it, but the smell in here is really good. <laughs> it's really good. There's so many challenges in a First Nation community. Like yeah. this is the fact, this is like one of the only buildings that's even on a water line. So yeah. that was why I was on a list for here for so long, right? I'm like, right. it's in the village, it's where there's actual water. But there's over 20,000 people, so, <laughs> so what do they do? A lot of people just don't have running water in First Nation communities still. Living on the res is not always peaches and cream. There are conditions that have to be dealt with. No water? In big cities, taps are turned on without a second thought. We didn't have dairy wheat, free. we didn't have dairy, we didn't have gluten. <laughs> Corn was our main grain, so that's where our calories came from. So dairy, definitely not. And that's one of the things that just makes indigenous food like this perfect diet. Yeah. Three um, sisters, is that, the, do the Six Nations believe in that? Or is it, is it, that come, it, comes from, it comes from here, but it's so Hollywood now. I just, yeah, I don't, yeah. you, you don't see me use a lot of the fad words. I'm like, yeah, yeah. decolonization, no, that's food great. justice. I can't keep up with your fancy words. I'll just talk about food. <laughs>
What's Dayton bringing over now? Is that? Is that a heart? Yeah, it's mine. Oh my god. Are you asking me to be your Valentine? <laughs> This oh actually, my god. This is actually a deer heart. When you shoot your first deer, it's yeah. important that you eat the heart. Okay. You gotta take a chunk. My why first is that? chunk was right here. Why is that? Why do you why is it's it important? Just, it's just a tradition thing. What is what does heart taste like? Or it, yeah. It, it just tastes like deer meat if you ever had it. Venison, yeah. Like yeah. I've had venison, yeah. Yes, it tastes very good. We throw it in the pot and we boil it for well maybe good two hours, an hour, then we yeah. put salt in. So you'd be amazed how yeah. good it tastes with just salt. Okay, maybe folks in big cities aren't used to seeing this. Besides being super healthy, when cooked right, you'd be like, I can't believe it's not the most tender beef tenderloin. Every part of the deer is used, so there's no wastage. This is also edible. When you shoot a deer, you want to do this right away. Take out. Yes. Otherwise, it, what, what happens? Sometimes when you leave them in a tree too long, the yeah. birds will get at them and okay. other animals will come by. Like I've seen yeah. my buddy, his dog shoot up his deer in one day. So it was wow. a waste, yeah. It's better than kibbles and bits, right? <laughs> I wonder if I could put that in my kids' lunch boxes. <laughs> so I'd love to show you guys the deer horns in the head, but that's at home. Once you taste all this in the soup and yeah. the corn and the beans, and the broth, it's so delicious. I can imagine, yeah. So we make it very differently from other people. Yeah. We don't want to say it's better, but you know, you know yeah. about it. <laughs> I know. You know about it. What's the difference between a scone and a bannock, really, in terms of ingredients? It's the way that it's cooked, I believe bannock's cooked in um, uh, frying oil, like yeah. grease. And then we're actually going to bake these in the oven. Oh, healthy, healthy. Yes. Taking, taking the oil element out. Yeah, taking that away and trying to feed the community as healthily yeah. as we can. Elk is super healthy. It's lean, yeah. lots of protein. I do, I do rice. end up mixing um, a little bit of burger in. Like beef burger? Yeah, oh, okay, okay. because of the fat content. Even in our own community, people have lost that palate for our traditional foods because they're just not that available that much. To me, introducing this stuff to our diet is more important than being you know, a hero that's going to eat all pre-colonial all day, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's if not no even, that's not, that if that's no one's not possible it. for me. How am I supposed to do it in a restaurant, right? It's yeah. so hard to source these foods. Yeah. I'm used to working with a pen. I'm a writer. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> from a pen to a spoon, right? What in the world does a seed keeper like Terry Lynn do? Well, she grows and protects varieties of seeds using ancestral practices. But more than that, she has deep Haudenosaunee knowledge on agricultural food systems. Terry Lynn doesn't live in symbiosis with nature because she watched a Netflix documentary which said global temperatures were rising and water tables were falling. She was bout it bout it before environmentalism was cool. So far as to grow her kids up in a household without electricity and running water. Do you know Bartolome de Casa? He's called the um, father of racism. That's where the Pope decided that the trial would be. And the trial was where they, to determine whether these people in North and South, in all this new world area, were human or not. I'm not joking when I say there's something called the Doctrine of Discovery, a law that was ratified 500 years ago by the Pope, for which the effects are still being felt today. If that papal bull gets rescinded, right, then that means that Europe, the Europeans that came had no right to North, South, Central America and the Caribbean. They have no legal right to it. If How Six do you Nations represent? alone was given back their territory, we would bankrupt Canada. In Ontario, you have three basic indigenous peoples. The Haudenosaunee, um, the Anishinaabe, or the Ojibwe as people call them, and the Muskegamuk, which are the Cree. You had the Anishinaabe who were meat and, and meat eaters, basically. So that's what their diet was. Now you come over to the Haudenosaunee, we were vegetarians because we were farmers. And that's why things like being seed keepers and being farmers has become a, such an important tradition. We developed highly um, sophisticated agricultural systems. And that became the only way that we were defeated when they wanted to defeat the Haudenosaunee people. Um, there was something called the Sullivan Campaign, and what they basically did was burn all, all our fields because they couldn't starve us out. We just had huge 
huge uh, storehouses of food. The Haudenosaunee people lived right at the edge of the Carolinian forest. So that's one of the things that as a seed keeper, it's not really saving the seed that I really try to do, yeah. is I try to reproduce the ecosystem that supported those seeds. So I do have a Carolinian um, bush down here that I'm always adding things to it, like certain flowers or plants or flora. Like they're yeah. being decimated by housing developments, nobody yeah. cares. Mm -hmm. and, and that's sad because like Carolinian forests are like home to like 80% of the endangered species in Canada. Unencumbered land development. We hear about the Amazon shrinking, African species of animals going extinct. But rarely do we hear about North American forests being on death row, or even that we have our own savannas. If anyone knows about GMOs, it would be Terry Lynn. You know, we're in the, within the probably last 10 years of being able to genetically modify seed, and that's the problem. Like corn, you can only tweak corn so much and it's not gonna be corn anymore. It has no nutritional value. It only thing is, is it kind of looks like the right shape. That's it. You know, food security and the concept of indigenous food didn't just pop up out of nowhere. This is the Tuscarora white corn. So that's the white corn that you see hanging from the ceiling. That's this kind of corn. So that's been nixtamalized. Oh, that corn but tastes that's, delicious. But yeah, but you can see the difference in the taste mm -hmm. of that and the taste of hominy, right? Oh yeah. It, tastes, it doesn't taste like hominy corn. Yeah, this it, is the, wow. the flavor is way different. This is Three Sisters soup. Mm -hmm. So with this one. Um, there's a couple kinds of corns in there. There's about four different kinds of beans and fresh beans. You can see any of the beans, where are they? <laughs> is there ginger? I put ginger and turmeric in it, yeah. Yeah, you can taste the ginger. Yeah. So this is a, a stuffed acorn squash and it's stuffed with uh, ground turkey. There's wild rice in there. Oh. Whoa. To me, it's not like what is our food, is what can we do with it, mm -hmm. right? Like, not all food has to be clean or bland and a lot of people think that about indigenous food, but no, that's, uh, that's very flavorful. This is uh, elk meatballs and it has a blueberry sweetgrass barbecue sauce on it. We made a hominy um, mac and cheese and these have mashed beans on there. If you think all indigenous peoples lived in teepees, get that shit out of your head. The word Haudenosaunee translates to people of the longhouse. They could have easily been called people of the mansions if they had that word back then. We've gone back to the future with this massively open concept replica from the 17th century. 80 feet long, 23 feet wide, and 26 feet high at the peak. And this is the average size. Longhouses up to 360 feet long have been uncovered by archaeologists. With the touch of modern heating, hell, I would rent this out for an Airbnb experience. Anywhere from 20 to more families could live in. And it was pretty well just your mother's wife. So like a lot of the men went off and married into um, different clans and things like that. Right. So they wouldn't necessarily stay in their mother's longhouse. They would move every 20 years or so. Yeah. Just because it was always about letting things rejuvenate again. So even yeah. just like animal population or even taking from the forest, right? Because we need firewood and things like that. Yeah. We wouldn't take the whole ecosystem, right? Right, right. So there would always be that little bit left over yeah. to let itself grow again. Opposite of developers now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I a little piece of land, let's build a condo. Yeah, right? Right. Oh my God, this is actually really comfortable. Yeah. Wow. Forget Casper mattresses, this is better. <laughs> so you would have, oh, yeah. again, hides as your wall. Because if you want to have children, like, you got to <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it was said that um, there was, like, a love shack. Oh, hey, no, no, just no. For See, that. this is the stuff that's not written in the book. That's <laughs> hilarious. Not the cornfield. Right. Don't go to the cornfield. <laughs> we got to eat that corn, man. <laughs> that's a Fred Flintstone-sized mortar and pestle. I love this. This is amazing. I like cooking, so this is uh, this is right up my alley. I'll put this in my backyard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, guys, come over. We're having, a, we're having a party. Tanya's food is comforting, and she effectively mixes the familiar with the unfamiliar. She's like that aunt whose house you looked forward to going to because you knew the food was going to be good. I had a great time while learning a ton in the process. Being a little wiser, I'm ready for our next adventure. 
Join us next episode as we head to Owen Sound to visit Zach Keeshing for some progressive Aboriginal cuisine and go from foraging to farm to table for a mind-blowing meal.